Uh, let me just say at the beginning that I don't feel like I'm coming here as some kind of wise expert to dispense knowledge. I feel like I'm here with colleagues who really know as much about the field of early childhood as I do. So what, what I'm going to do in this opening session is to kick off to the panel and then at the end is, is to very quickly kind of share with you how we are thinking about um, the way to use this revolution in science that we're living through right now, particularly in neuroscience and molecular biology, to bring um, some new ways of thinking about what has been a longstanding challenge of how we can intervene um, in a constructive way early in life to improve life outcomes for all children. So um, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. I'm really much more looking forward to the panel than I am to listening to myself talk. Um, so um, what I've been asked to speak about is, is, is what our current thinking might be about building skills of parents who are facing a significant adversity in raising their young children. This issue of the role of parents is not some brilliant new idea uh, in the field of early childhood policy or practice. Um, and the central importance of parents, obviously, is something that um, is, has not only been scientifically understood for, for oh, decades and decades and decades, but um, from a common sense point of view, it's been understood since the beginning of the species. But what I want to do is to put this in, in context, is that there are multiple sources of knowledge that, um, that lead us to understand the importance of the early childhood years. And um, this is not just about scientific research. Um, and this, these, knowledge, these knowledge sources, um, up until relatively recently, has been, have been used to make the case, particularly to policymakers and to opinion leaders and, and uh, people who influence the way resources are used, to make the case of why the early childhood years are so important. Um, to basically say, this is why what we're doing needs support, this is why it needs investment, this is what the payoff will be. But I, what we've been learning over the last few years is that there's another use for these multiple sources of knowledge, not just to make the case for why what we're doing is important, but to figure out what are we going to do differently going forward? What, what is 21st century early childhood policy and practice going to look like, particularly from the point of view of how we can increase the magnitude of the impact of what we do? So this, these knowledge sources, and we'll spend the whole morning talking about this, they obviously come from advances in science. We'll talk a little bit about that. They also come from rigorous evaluation of programs and practices and policies that have been studied um, over the years. Um, they come from practical on-the-ground expertise, I have to say, kind of trying to live in, in at least two or three of these worlds. Um, there's a big difference between understanding uh, human development understanding the different influences on um, children's health and their learning and their ultimate life outcomes. The difference between understanding it and then doing something about it. But, and the doing something about it um, obviously needs to be grounded in very strong science. Um, but it doesn't just kind of happen. And there's an expertise and a wisdom and a, a, an experiential knowledge base that is critical to whether any of our policies or practices will make a difference. And I'm not, I'm not one of those people who puts them on a scale of relative importance. Uh, um, practical experience without good scientific knowledge is not going to take us where we need to go. Uh, the best scientific knowledge in the world that has no clue as to what life is like for people who work in programs and families is not going to have an impact either. So it's the convergence of all of these. And what it also recognizes, and obviously from the way this morning began in my comment earlier, um, there is a knowledge of a cultural context here such that um, um, it's not just a matter of what the best experience and the best wisdom and the best science can tell us about generically how we promote healthy development, but children don't grow up um, out of a context of a culture that's based on values, that's based on beliefs, that's based on practices, and all of these have to come together. So this is the ultimate level playing field if we want to make a big difference. It doesn't have to be a level playing field if we don't really care about making a difference. If we just care about writing scientific papers or advocating for particular programs, um, those can basically have their own agendas. But if we really want to make a difference for children, we desperately need to recognize the value of each of these sources. So I'm, I'm not going to pretend to have expertise in all these areas. You, you invited me here to kind of present the scientific contribution to this, which I'm delighted to do, but I just want to be clear from the beginning that I am not a scientific imperialist about this. I think there's a role, but for those of us 
who are primarily based in universities, um, who want to make a difference. We desperately depend upon being used um, by people who are out there in the policy arena and the practice arena and in the applied research arena or else uh, we become pretty irrelevant pretty quickly. So um, what I want to do is start, and for some of you this will be, you could do this presentation as well as I can. For some of you, this may be a little bit of an introduction to a mysterious world, which is the revolution that is going on right now in biology. The revolution in neuroscience and molecular biology and genomics and epigenetics, and if these words are a little bit unclear. I'm going to show you a video now that, that runs a little bit less than a minute and a half. It will tell you everything you need to know about 21st century neuroscience that's relevant for the policies and practices we're talking about. It took, it actually took two years to produce this video. It's on our website and you can download it and you can use it any way you want. Why did it take two years? Because we had a group of hard-nosed scientists who worked closely with the production people to make sure that this was unimpeachably scientifically accurate. So you can take this to the bank. You can show this to any group and be confident that the, the, the most kind of crusty, narrow-minded, pointy-headed scientists would look at this and say it's absolutely correct. There's no exaggeration here. There's nothing that's wrong. So here's your crash course in 21st century neuroscience in terms of what we know about the development of the brain early in life. A child's experiences during the earliest years of life have a lasting impact on the architecture of the developing brain. Genes provide the basic blueprint, but experiences shape the process that determines whether a child's brain will provide a strong or weak foundation for all future learning, behavior, and health. During this important period of brain development, billions of brain cells called neurons send electrical signals to communicate with each other. These connections form circuits that become the basic foundation of brain architecture. Circuits and connections proliferate at a rapid pace and are reinforced through repeated use. Our experiences and environment dictate which circuits and connections get more use. Connections that are used more grow stronger and more permanent. Meanwhile, connections that are used less fade away through a normal process called pruning. Well-used circuits create lightning-fast pathways for neural signals to travel across regions of the brain. Simple circuits form first, providing a foundation for more complex circuits to build on later. Through this process, neurons form strong circuits and connections for emotions, motor skills, behavioral control, logic, language, and memory during the early critical period of development. With repeated use, these circuits become more efficient and connect to other areas of the brain more rapidly. While they originate in specific areas of the brain, the circuits are interconnected. You can't have one type of skill without the others to support it. Like building a house, everything is connected, and what comes first forms a foundation for all that comes later. So the, the basic concepts here, and I'll highlight them for you, are, are really... Um, where we are at the frontier, a very sophisticated biological study of how a brain develops and how the skills and the competencies that are tied into the circuitry of the brain uh, emerge over time. So for starters, brains are built over time. They're not fully formed at birth. At, at birth, you have mo we have most of the brain cells, not all of them, but most of the cells, but very little of the connections among the cells. And it's that circuitry that really is the essence of how the brain works. Um, each of us is born with a different kind of genetic predisposition in a variety of areas. We all don't have the same full range of possibilities, but where we end up in that range of possibilities is literally determined by our life experiences. So none of the things that we care about that we're going to talk about today, um, thinking, feeling, emotional regulation, language development, uh, behavioral control, none of those is hardwired at birth. And where we end up is determined by how our experiences and the world in which we live shape our brain. And this comes not just from human studies. This is from studies of all animal species. This is basic biology. So very simply to think about this is the brain from the beginning, and this actually begins before birth. The brain is trying to read the environment and figure out how to be optimally adaptive. And the signals it gets from the environment are telling us what's telling the brain what's important, what you need to build skills on, what is less important. 
And from a science point of view, when we talk about the impact of experiences or the impact of the environment, that's not specific enough for science. You can't measure, quote, the environment. So what have we learned from a scientific point of view about what is it about the environment? What is it about experiences that liter literally shape the architecture of the brain? Well, the answer to that is it is the environment of relationships that children grow up with. So this, we're going to be focusing on parents and families in this presentation because that's what you asked me to talk about. But you need to remember that it, is, it, it begins in the family. C clearly, the role of parents and primary caregivers is critically important for brain development. But it is not exclusively about the family. And it is also not exclusively about um, the individuals within a family. It's all of the relationships. And I, to go back, I start here. These pictures are all intentionally selected for reasons. Obviously, we know a lot about the importance of mothers interactions with their children, but fathers are not irrelevant to this process. So there's nothing about the brain that says you have to have um, two X chromosomes in order to meet my needs, right? So fathers, um, as children get older, the interactions that they have with adults that are these kind of reciprocal, what we call serve and return interactions, it has to be engaging and reciprocal. Babies do not learn from educational videotapes. They don't learn from television. When you're a little bit older, you can learn things from television, but not when you're, in a, when you're a baby. Um, children are exposed to reading before their brain is capable of being able to master reading, but those foundational skills in basic language competence are the precursors of literacy, but also is the social interaction around the act of reading and the exploration of the learning process. At some point, children don't need adults to teach them to read anymore. They can read without adult supervision. They read with each other. They read alone. But it's also not just the family. It's people who work with children in programs. It's people who engage with children in community settings, in playgrounds, in neighborhoods. All of these things, from a scientific point of view, are influencing the way the brain is literally forming its circuits. When the interactions are positive and responsive in a reasonably predictive environment, then the brain builds strong circuits. When the relationships are tenuous, when they're unstable, when they're unpredictable, if they're, if they're neglectful in a significant way, I don't mean a bad day. What happens if anybody leaves here before I'm finished? Don't go home <laughs> thinking that every minute matters in that if you're kind of, in a, if you're kind of strung out or you just can't be responsive all the time. It's not doing harm to a baby's brain. We're not that fragile. We're talking about patterns over time. But literally, it's the responsiveness that creates healthy brain circuits. And you can't, once the circuits are made, the brain goes on to build more complex circuits. You can't go back and rewire a circuit. You can go back and try to adapt. I'll talk about that in a little bit. So this is, this is high stakes, but at the same time, uh, in the early years of public awareness about this science, there was an overcorrection on the part of some people who were a little bit overzealous in wanting to get the message through. And you have some of these remnants of, you know, the window closes at age three. Uh, Eighty percent of the brain is developed by two years of age. That's actually a totally inaccurate figure. There's no, there's no percentage you can put on brain development based on function. That's a number that comes from the size of your head which does stop growing at a certain point, even though your brain keeps developing. But the point is that this is a constant process that increases the likelihood of better outcomes or decreases the probability of better outcomes, but it doesn't fully determine your life course. So you've, we've got to get this balance. It's a tremendously important time of life. It's a critically important time to build a strong foundation. A difficult time to leave with a weak foundation, but it's never too late to make things better. It's never too late to intervene. Um, but what you do if you intervene later is you don't get as good an outcome as you would have gotten if you had done it right the first time, and you pay more for less. That's, that's the challenge. Um, now, OK, so now your, your crash course in normal neuroscience brain development just ended. Um, if you're ever given a multiple choice examination that asks about anything in brain development um, and says, is it A, genetically determined, B, influenced by the environment, C, neither, or D, both. The correct answer is always both, always both. Okay? So none of these things are determined from birth. But what happens on really matters. So now I want to shift 
um, and go to what do we know about what I'll call the biology of adversity? What do we know about the impact on brain development in circumstances where <coughs> it is not a, con a reasonably consistent, predictable, responsive, nurturing environment that provides rich opportunities for learning? So these data are taken from a study in the United States of children in the child welfare system, all of whom were kind of confirmed cases of having been abused or neglected. It's about 11, 1,200 children. It was looking at the question of in addition, in addition to being abused or neglected, what's the impact of other risk factors on a child's life um, that will influence performance on a developmental test at age three? So this is looking at maltreatment plus um, all of these risk factors that are higher likelihood of problems later. Limited parent education, limited family income, uh, difficulties with the emotional and mental health problems in the family, particularly depression in mothers, substance abuse in the family, family violence, all of those things. And what you get is a pattern that is consistent with anything that's ever been studied in over 100 years that asks the question of what's the relationship between bad things happening in your life and X? And X can be IQ, reading scores, behavior, physical health, mental health, and this is what it looks like. So a couple of risk factors doesn't do you in. We're not that fragile. If we were that fragile, we would be, you know, kind of with the dinosaurs and other species that, that couldn't make it, that couldn't survive. So we're not, <clears throat> it's not like children have to have everything going exactly right in their lives. Um, but as the number of risk factors increases, now when you get to six or seven of these risk factors, on average, on a population study, uh, basically everybody is failing a developmental test at age three, on the way toward failure in school, on the way toward needing special education services, on the way to being less likely to be a productive member of society. Um, and it's not just an impact on emotional development or social development, it's an impact on language, impact on cognition. It's this pile up of adversity. Now, what is this telling us about the brain? Well, in the old days, before all the things we know now, um, a lot of people said, well, I, you know, I don't know. We don't know what's going on in the brain. But basically, a developmental test is to the brain as a urine analysis is to the kidney. The, if the developmental test says you're doing well, it means your brain is doing the things it needs to do. And if you're not, it means there's something in your brain that is responsible for the fact that um, you're not doing things on an age-expected level. But again, let me say, in case anybody leaves before I finished, you would be leaving with the wrong conclusion and it's scientifically inaccurate assumption that what we're saying is that adversity causes permanent brain damage. No, there's no, there's no reason to say that. What we're talking about with all of these things in early childhood, except at the extremes, at the really gross extremes, is to say we are either increasing or decreasing the probability of a successful outcome. This is about relative risk. This is also about relative risk on a population basis. It doesn't tell you anything about this particular child right here. It's very important, particularly for policymakers to think about this, for provi service providers to think about this. You can't extrapolate from population data and say, this is going to happen to this child. In the same way that you can't pick out, because there's always, there's always at least one, there's usually more than one, you can't pick out the child who came from the most extremely adverse circumstances, who made it successfully, and say, okay, he did it, everybody else, you do that too. And don't expect us to help you. It doesn't work that way. That's not the way science works, because variation is the name of the game here. So let me now go to a second study that's not that far away. I'm not going to take you all the way over to the United States. We'll just take a quick puddle jumper to New Zealand. <laughs> Some of you probably are very familiar with the Dunedin uh, birth cohort study. This was a study begun probably about 40 years ago in Dunedin, a relatively, I guess, a relatively small city or medium-sized city in New Zealand. Um, every pregnant woman in the city over a course of a year was invited to participate in a study. Very large percentage said fine. Started collecting data while women were pregnant and then collected data after the pregnancy uh, uh, was over and a child was born and the children as they've grown up have had data collected. So it's all been very rigorously collected prospective data, not just depending on people's memory. I'm going to show you data on measurement at age 31 years of adults who've been followed since they were fetuses um, on measuring something in the blood called C-reactive protein. 
This is a marker of inflammation. It a, it's a, has a well-known association with a higher risk for heart disease. So think of it as something like an elevated cholesterol if you have an elevated C-reactive protein. It doesn't mean you have heart disease, but it means you're at greater risk for heart disease. So here at age 31, this is what the C-reactive protein in the blood looked like in, again, about 1,200 individuals. So about 15 to 20 percent of healthy 31-year-olds with a pretty uneventful history in terms of risk factors, about 15 to 20 percent had elevated C-reactive proteins, indicated some slight increased risk for heart disease at age 31, um, probably genetically determined. So people who all had kind of no particularly untoward events in their lives. The next was 32-year-olds who had a clinical diagnosis of depression had a higher rate of elevated C-reactive protein. And this confirmed many studies that have been done before. This is a well-known association that depression is associated with an increased activation of the inflammatory system. You know, which causes which and how they're related has yet to be figured out, but this is a kind of well-known association. So this confirmed uh, uh, a previously uh, uh, discovered scientific finding. The next thing I'm going to show you was something that was, this was one of the first times this was found. This was not a well-known uh, phenomenon. It has been replicated many times in many other studies around the world since this time. 32-year-olds who had a documented history of having been maltreated as children had higher C-reactive proteins than adults with depression at a rate of um, somewhat over 30 percent, about one in three. This was not some report of having been maltreated. This was documented at the time, um, and this persisted. This has been replicated many times. There is now a well-defined relationship between significant maltreatment and excessive activation of the inflammatory system as part of the stress response. And the last group were 32-year-olds who had both documented maltreatment as children and clinical depression at age 32. About two out of five of those adults had elevated C-reactive protein. So a scientist looks at that, and when asked, what does that mean, a scientist says, well, you know, it's one study. Uh, you know, let's not get carried away with ourselves, but it's an interesting association that this was a well-designed study. But if you step back and then ask a scientist, what does it mean that we could have seen this again and again in studies right now? We're beginning to get, although the scientists will always tell you, there's much more we need to understand about this. But, and that's what we love about scientists, because they keep pushing the frontiers. But now what is, what is unequivocally clear is that significant maltreatment in childhood creates biological changes in stress response systems that don't go away in many cases. So think of this as uh, saying, well, if, a ch if you had significant maltreatment as a child, you may, and that didn't continue, you may or may not remember it, you may repress it. If it happened when you were very young, you're, you're certainly not going to remember it. You're too young to consciously remember that, but the body doesn't forget. And that there are biological memories that continue through your life showing a marker of some th adversity that happened early. Now, again, I don't want to overstate this, I don't want to understate it, but here's, here's the honest, balanced way to look at this. Significant adversity affects stress response systems that can create biological changes that we can't just dismiss and say, well, that was a long time ago. Or, you know, I don't know that that child really understood what was going on. Because the other thing about this is it's beginning to open up the black box of what is it about adversity that leads you to be at greater risk for a whole host of problems down the road. We have known for more than 100 years in every country in the world that the poorer you are and the more adversity you experience, the more likely you are to have problems in school, but also with physical and mental health, and more likely not to live as long. You're more likely to get heart disease. You're more likely to get diabetes. You're more likely to get hypertension. You're more likely to get a whole host of cancers. All of which, is this genetic? Is it environment? It's always both, right? There's always contribution. But this is beginning to help us understand the social determinants of learning, development, behavior, and health, okay? that these are lasting influences. Individuals overcome things, but as a, on a population basis, we ignore this at our peril. I will say particularly in this day and age, it's like the science on climate change. Okay? You can pay attention to it or you can ignore it. Either way, it doesn't make the science go away. 
right? We can ignore this, but it doesn't make the science go away. So to me, this is not, I don't end here with a doom and gloom, oh my goodness, poor us. It's like this is a wake-up call, right? This is, this is an invitation to say, okay, what are we going to do about this? Because it creates a greater sense of urgency about the early years. So now here's your second video. This is your one minute, 30 second summary of the biology of adversity and what we call toxic stress. Learning to deal with stress is an important part of healthy development. When experiencing stress, the stress response system is activated. The body and brain go on alert. There's an adrenaline rush, increased heart rate, and an increase in stress hormone levels. When the stress is relieved after a short time, or a young child receives support from caring adults, the stress response winds down and the body quickly returns to normal. In severe situations such as ongoing abuse and neglect, where there is no caring adult to act as a buffer against the stress, the stress response stays activated. Even when there is no apparent physical harm, the extended absence of response from adults can activate the stress response system. Constant activation of the stress response overloads developing systems with serious lifelong consequences for the child. This is known as toxic stress. Over time, this results in a stress response system set permanently on high alert. In the areas of the brain dedicated to learning and reasoning, the neural connections that comprise brain architecture are weaker and fewer in number. Science shows that the prolonged activation of stress hormones in early childhood can actually reduce neural connections in these important areas of the brain at just the time when they should be growing new ones. Toxic stress can be avoided if we ensure that the environments in which children grow and develop are nurturing, stable, and engaging. Everybody think of a moment when you have been really severely stressed by something, on a deadline, on a project, something that went really wrong, a budget crisis, a political problem, or a personal issue in your family. And think about, not the cause, but think about what you feel like, right? So you feel, you, we vary in terms of how we feel. Do you feel the tightness in your neck, your tightness in the pit of your stomach, you feel your heart racing, you're sweating, you're just, whatever it is, a pounding headache. Uh, but you know that we physically respond to stress. Well, that, that, is, that is our stress system going into high gear. Um, our stress system is our friend. Without a stress system, we wouldn't survive. This is every, every animal species has a stress system. This is the source of the fight or flight phenomenon, right? It's, it, it, it changes, it, it, it sends blood to your brain and to your muscles. It increases you know, your blood sugar goes way up to provide fuel for sharp thinking and for muscle contraction. Um, your inflammatory system, the C-reactive protein being one part of it, your inflammatory system is activated, it is ready to deal with wounds that are going to be inflicted. It's ready to deal with the potential of infection that's going to come in if you're being slashed. This is a physical life or death threat. It's a kind of psychological life or death threat. And all of these things are in the service of dealing with an acute challenge or threat or stress. Um, and without it, we'd be in big trouble. I mean, forget the, you know, the woolly mammoth coming at us from kind of evolutionary biology, but if you're in a work situation, it's kind of like if you're saying, well, you know, who cares? And the whole thing falls apart. That's not good. So it's not bad to have a stress response. The problem is the stress response was meant to ramp up in an acute situation to make you optimally ready to cope, to deal, to adapt. And then you deal with it, hopefully you've survived. If you haven't survived, it doesn't really matter, it's a moot question. But if you've survived, your stress system then has to go back to baseline. Right? All these systems can't be activated all the time. Think of your most severely stressed physical sensation and imagine as this is where, you know, your grandmother could have told you that, that can't be good for you to be feeling that way all the time, and it's not, okay? So your blood pressure comes down, your heart rate comes down, your blood sugar comes down, your inflammatory system goes back to baseline, your stress hormones come down, and you're back to baseline and ready to ramp up again for the next stress. So um, the first thing, I, I, don't know, I don't know Australian culture well enough to know, um, but in the United States, um, playing the stress card's a big problem. 
because the political culture could care less. The political culture says, you know, you're on your own. Uh, stress, then deal with it. Learn to deal with it. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Don't expect, other, don't expect other people to help you. Don't expect the government to help you. You know, you're on your own. Um, most countries are not like that. Most countries have more of a sense, and most societies of, you know, we're kind of in this, we have a shared responsibility. But so, the issue of how much stress is an important thing to kind of have people understand depends upon the political culture. In the United States, we have to work really hard to help people understand that there's a difference between what we call positive stress for children, which is kind of, you know, you have to learn to share your toys. No, you're not the only person in the world. You have to go in for a nap now. You can't have five cookies. Those things ramp up the stress system in young children. Um, it's important for them to learn how to deal with that kind of stress. Or the stress of a first day in a child care center where there's a lot of people you don't know or stress of getting an immunization at the doctor's office. So that's positive stress. Your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, your stress hormones go up. And there's an adult there, usually your parent or someone else, who basically helps you settle down. It helps you like face the fact that you're not the only person in the world or tell you no, that pain from the shot is going to go away. And that's what we call positive stress, brief increases in activation, facilitated by adults kind of helping you get back to baseline. And that's how you learn to develop your own ability to deal with stress. There's another level of stress that's worse than no, you can't um, eat all that candy, which is the stress from serious threats like the death or serious illness of a member of the family um, or a severe natural disaster like a tsunami or an earthquake where there's a lot of destruction or an act of terrorism or exposure to violence or serious family strife on and on and on where it's not just a matter of well things will get better right away and instinctively even before we knew the science oh I'm sorry I'm supposed to be standing here sorry oops yeah. um, instinctively before we understood the biology we understood as a, an adaptive species that the way to help children get through is to give them a sense of security and have them feel a sense that they're not without protection from adults and at the same time modeling, coping, and adaptive behavior. And we call that tolerable stress because it's more than just positive stress. And the essential element there is that there are adult relationships that are helping the child um, bring the stress system back to baseline, which is essential for good health. An essential for healthy brain development, what this video shows is that um, when there's constant activation of the stress system, particularly the stress hormones, they can disrupt the development of circuits just at the time when they're supposed to be built and supposed to be strengthened. This is not normal pruning. This is disrupting important circuits. And the parts of the brain that are most vulnerable to this disruption are the parts of the brain involved in simple memory, response to threat, and higher order functioning later. So these are important brain areas. Um, I'll say a little bit about them in a few minutes. That leaves us with the third category, a term that we coined in our National Scientific Council 11 years ago, toxic stress. Talk about a term that went viral. Little did we know, right? We worked with communications researchers. We were trying to find a simple way of communicating a complex scientific concept, which is excessive activation of all of these complex biological systems can have a toxic effect on the brain, on the cardiovascular system, on the immune system, and lead to all these problems later on. Um, the scientists in the group battled about our first paper on this, did not have the word toxic stress in the title. It said exe it was, ex this was a great compromise. Some of the scientists felt this sounded too sensationalistic. He said, it sounds like yellow journalism, let's just call it excessive stress. Um, the communications researchers said, don't worry, you can have it on page four. As soon as people read it, they'll never forget it. And they were right. They were absolutely correct. Because this is toxic stress. This is excessive persistent, repetitive activation of stress response systems in the absence of the buffering protection of adults who are basically doing two things. Buffering children from the source of the stress, creating a sense of, of safety and security so children's own st stress systems came down, and also modeling the development of adaptive behaviors to learn how to cope with stress. Now you also see why we developed these videos. I just took 10 minutes to explain something that we did in a minute and 25 seconds, right? And that was the reason for it, but I'm, I'm still good with the clock. So, okay, so you've got two pieces now. You have what we understand about 
healthy development of brain circuitry under good enough circumstances of a responsive, interactive environment? And what happens in the face of significant disruption of these critical caregiving relationships that buffer children from adversity and model adaptive behavior? So this raises the issue of what do we mean by resilience? Okay, so again, this is an oversimplification based on very complicated science. And all of you know this as well or better than I do. So basically every one of us in our lives has in our life history and in our current circumstances a mix of what we call risk factors that increase the likelihood of problems and what we call protective factors which increase the likelihood of positive outcomes. There are no, there are no individuals who've had kind of perfect lives without threat to healthy development. And there are no individuals who've had it made and, and, and without any worry about adversity. And this cuts across all social classes, all income groups, all education levels. And our basic understanding of resilience, which is defined as doing well in spite of adversity, doing well in the face of kind of odds against you, can be thought of as a simple balance between what's, what's the relative load of risk factors in your life that are going to lead, lives that are going to lead to problems and protective factors that are going to protect you. And basically, resilience, which is not a positive outcome. Resilience is a positive outcome in the face of adversity. Okay. And we basically have this notion that if you have more positive things going on in your life that counterbalance the negative, you'll basically do all right. And that pretty much is reasonably true, on average, on a population basis. But there's another issue here, which is this fulcrum. If we think of this, as a balance between risk and protective factors. Where the fulcrum is matters. Here the fulcrum is in the middle on this teeter-totter. But we don't all have our fulcrum. We don't, we're not all born with a fulcrum in the same place. Okay, so some children are born with a fulcrum that's displaced. I'm, this is a metaphor. But what I'm saying is that some kids are just more vulnerable than others, constitutionally. Anybody, anybody who's worked in a newborn nursery and seen a whole lot of newborns, or any parent who's had more than one child, or anybody who knows anybody who's had more than one child, or anybody who lived in a family that had more than one child knows that everybody's not born the same. Okay? And there are a lot of very healthy, perfectly normal kids who are headed for a great future who are really a, a pain <laughs> to take care of as babies. You know, they just kind of they cry more, they're irritable, they're ornery, they're hard to please perfectly normal, perfectly healthy, but there's, there are differences. There are differences in temperament, differences in kind of constitutional responsiveness to the environment. So some kids are born with a fulcrum where they're, they're more vulnerable because they're more sensitive and because they're harder to please, even as infants, not willfully. And that's a higher risk. It's more likely that people will kind of get agitated by you. So the question is, for some kids, you can have here, you've got a whole lot of positive factors in your life, not that many negative, but because of where your fulcrum is, you might end up with poor outcomes. So the question is, what do we do about it? Are we stuck with it? And no. Science tells us, again, it's still a metaphor, you can move the fulcrum. If someone is someone who's a child who's more sensitive to negative things, we can move that fulcrum where actually you can get positive outcomes even with more negative things on the other side. And what does that? What is the key for building resilience? It's a combination of three things. First, responsive relationships are really big. We can promote resilient outcomes by helping children develop adaptive skills. Okay? We can promote better outcomes by giving children a sense of greater mastery, of a sense of having some control over your own environment. And the big one here also is, it's been shown in study after study, not by advocates, but by scientists, that children who grow up in environments in which there's a sense of faith and cultural tradition Ten, that, that's a real protective factor for resilience if we kind of build on that. Okay, so the issue here is it is scientifically dead wrong to say that some kids are just born resilient and other kids are not and there's nothing you can do about it. It is even more scientifically wrong to point to somebody really resilient and say there is a self-made person and that person willed it. This is the grit argument. This is saying anybody can overcome adversity if you just will it. Wrong. You can't do it by yourself. This is done in the context of supportive relationships. Every study that's ever been done of resilience, kids in poverty, kids living in war zones, survivors of the Holocaust,
children living in families with severe mental illness, the one thing that comes up over and over again in every study is anyone who overcame adversity could point to at least one person who made the difference in his or her life. I mean, that, when common sense and science come together, we're, in, we're really on firm ground. The science is very strong about that. So I want to shift now, just put a few things on the table, and then we'll go into the panel discussion. What I've done so far is to, is to extract for you some of the major insights that are coming from this kind of rapidly moving frontier of 21st century biology. It's helping us understand how experience gets into our bodies, affects our gene expression, and produces variations in outcome in learning, behavior, and physical and mental health. And now the question is, other than taking this science and saying, therefore, let's just invest in early childhood programs, is that we could start to take this science to ask the question of, what could we be doing differently to strengthen our policies, strengthen our programs, have bigger impacts? So up till now, this is all science. Everything here is backed up by strong science. My final 10 minutes is how this science looks to my colleagues and me, or how we could use it. So this is ideas. This is thinking. These are hypotheses. Okay. I don't, if you ask me what's the study that backs up what I'm going to say, I say, we haven't done that study yet. This is what we're using to design the studies we're thinking about now, because this field, like all healthy fields, has to keep moving forward. So what, could, what does 21st century science tell us, both on the positive side and on the adversity side, about how we might think differently about intervention in the early childhood years? And these are new ways of thinking for practitioners, for policymakers, for investors, for community leaders, and for anybody else, which actually leaves out nobody, who would care about the future of a population, who would care about the future of being a children. So I'm going to give you four th new things to think about. The first is, attention to development has to begin at birth, in fact, even prenatal. It can't just start at age four or five to define what we have in early childhood. Now, some of you are already beyond this, right? But in many, in many countries, certainly in, in the United States, um, most of the policy discussion right now and most of the investment is focused on preschool for four-year-olds, which um, I, I, and this is not an, an anti-preschool for four-year-old statement at all because by every way I can measure this, four is younger than five or six. <laughs> so that's good. That's good. If people are starting with, you know, let's, let's really get off to a good start in kindergarten or whatever age you started, to start a year earlier is a, is a good step forward. Um, and there's reason to do that. But sci neuroscience, neurobiology, and a deeper understanding of development looks at that and says, oh, you've got to be kidding. Four years old is not remotely early. It's not too late. It's definitely not too late, but it's not remotely early. In fact, three years old is not really early. And in fact, where the science is taking us now is birth is certainly a big step forward. Birth is not early. Birth is not early. A lot of stuff happens during pregnancy that influences later learning and later health. Particularly things like cardiovascular disease and diabetes can already be influenced by things that happen metabolically during pregnancy. And in fact, the latest thinking right now is that if you really want to start at the beginning, um, you have to start with the health of a woman before she becomes pregnant. Um, and increasingly now, maybe that health of the, the father-to-be as well. But I'll, I'll, settle, I'll settle for birth right now. Although, but scientifically, it's still not early enough. But it's certainly a big step forward. <coughs> Second, early experiences affect lifelong health, not just learning. This is not just about school readiness, although it is hugely important part of school readiness. This is also about decreasing the prevalence in a population of all of the major budget busters on the healthcare side. Heart disease, hypertension, stroke, diabetes, depression, substance abuse, various forms of cancer, they all have they all are disproportionately higher among disadvantaged populations, and we're beginning to understand their early childhood roots. And the most important, well, I'll get to this next thing uh, in a moment. So um, this should not all be on the poor backs of the, of, the, of the ministry or Department of Education and the education budget. This should be on the health budget as much as on the education budget. It should be on the human services budget as much as it should be on health or education. Um, and by the way, this is a huge economic development issue, right? This is, this is economic development. This is human capital 
investment. So there has to be some understanding. This is not just a political gimmick. This is kind of scientifically, uh, unequivocally true. This is as much about lifelong health as it is about learning. <coughs> Third, and I think the next one should be pretty logical from the things that I've presented so far, just a big issue for the early childhood field in terms of programming. Healthy development requires protection of the developing brain, not just enrichment of the developing mind. I'm going to let that sink in for a little bit. Our, our basic conceptual framework for early childhood policies and programs, which has been guiding this field for at least half a century globally, has been essentially an enrichment model. We provide enriched learning experiences for children with a heavy emphasis on language uh, facilitation. We provide information and advice for parents and support. But none of those things addresses the disruption to brain circuitry and other organ systems from toxic stress. Right? And many children who are not benefiting from enriched programs are not benefiting because we have not protected their developing brain to allow them to have the skills to, de to benefit from these enriched programs. And it won't come from more enrichment. It will come from a model that understands the need to protect the developing brain. Now, how do we do that? This is where we've really forced ourselves to kind of walk the talk. And I will tell you, everything now for the rest of my eight or 10 minutes is basically um, what I've been doing and learned about in the last five or six years. And six to 10 years ago, <coughs> I did not have these insights that I'm sharing with you now. And I wish I had had them sooner, but you know, better late than never, right? But, but it gets to this question of what could we be doing differently? And so now I'm going to be a little bit kind of provocative, not based on kind of scientific proof of what I'm going to say, but based on scientific thinking. And what we know is if what we need is to focus on health, not just learning. And by the way, the good part about this, you don't do something different for health. Right? So if you do something to protect the developing brain, which protects learning, for the same nickel with nothing else to do, you're protecting the cardiovascular system and the immune system for health because it's basically reducing the consequences of toxic stress. So how do we do that? So this is our hypothesis. This is our latest theory of change. It's driving our frontiers of innovation work. It's driving a lot of things that we're doing out there in the field right now, but we haven't, we don't have the data yet to kind of show this. But of course, like everything else, even if it's right, we're gonna stumble a lot along the way, but it's a different direction that I want to introduce for you to think about. Um, if we want to achieve far better outcomes for young children facing adversity, we have to do two things. We have to support the adults who are caring for them to help them change their own lives and build their own capabilities. This is not about giving people information about childhood. People living in deep poverty, dealing with violence, dealing with mental illness, dealing with substance abuse, dealing with a whole host of problems. Who would ever think that giving information about child development would be enough? Not, it's not that it's unimportant. It's not enough in the face of overwhelming adversity. And everything we know is the strongest predictor of children's outcomes is the economic circumstances and the education of their families. And you don't change the economic circumstances of a family by giving people advice on reading to their children and talking to their children. So we have to, and this is not about um, doing things to people, it's helping people change their lives, which means building the capabilities that are needed not only to create a well-regulated home environment, but to be able to get an economically self-supporting job, to be able to kind of get out of these terrible circumstances. That, for my, for my money, <laughs> um, I think, and this is going to be kind of a long way off, I think the revolution in child development and early childhood policy program will come from recognizing that we haven't spent enough time focusing on the adults. We spend too much time focusing on the kids. I think that is the fundamental change that science is screaming at us. The other thing is that we have to, Think about this community context. We've always talked about you know, the importance of, of strong communities. But this can't be all about having parents somehow have to cope with community contexts that are impossible to kind of raise healthy children in. And rather than just building adults' capacities to deal with problems you know, of community violence and lack of economic opportunity, you've got to relieve the burden on families where communities need to kind of provide that kind of support. So that, that would be a sea change. In the beginning when we talked about that, people said, wait a second, it's about the kids. We're talking about the kids. Why are you talking about economic development? Why are you talking about um, kind of parents 
needs. It's because the science tells us that those little children don't grow out of the context of those relationships. So this gets us to these, these, what are these capabilities? What are these core capabilities? This is the story of executive functioning and self-regulation capacity. So we know, we know what these skills are that are essential for effective parenting and for being a successful adult, being economically self-sufficient and being a contributing member of a community. There are things like the ability to focus and sustain your attention, set goals, make plans, monitor your actions, make decisions, solve problems, follow rules, control impulses, delay gratification. We know where the circuitry is for all of these skills. We know how they develop. Um, and that is kind of, um, and those skills start developing early. And they are the skills that are needed for effective parenting and for being an economically self-sufficient adult. So, um, so what does that mean in terms of early childhood? So I'm going to leave you with these two messages and then we'll jump right to the panel. The first is the challenge. So we keep going, we keep, we had, we keep going back to say what else could science tell us? Not because science is the only thing, but because that's our role. Right? Our role is to, make, is to keep pushing the frontiers of science and make it practically relevant for practitioners and policymakers and community leaders. As one seat at the table, we are depending on people in policy and practice and in community leadership to do their piece, and we'll do our piece, recognizing that it's only together that we're going to make a difference. Okay? And I depend upon people in these other fields to come up with some new thinking, too, because we desperately need new ideas. It's not that what we're doing now isn't making a difference. It's absolutely making a difference. I read some of the materials. I got Western Australia has been making more progress than other parts of the country. And some of these things, I read that stuff. You should, be, you should be both proud and impatient to kind of say, how do we get even better? Um, so this science has two messages for us. It has a sobering message and it has an uplifting message. Here's the sobering message. I'm going to start with this one. The ability to change brains and behavior decreases over time. This is what it looks like. This is, this always gets, everybody, the first thing everybody does is look for your age. <laughs> The, the basic message here is that the brain is optimally plastic, optimally adaptable, the younger it is. And that was also explained in the videos. You can get it if in the beginning you have very little circuitry, obviously all kinds of possibilities. As the brain gets more complex, more complex circuits, it prunes things away, it has less adaptability. Um, so here's, you can see it, it's highest in, in infancy and it drops pretty precipitously. By the time you get to age 10 or so, then it, it keeps dropping, but it's not as rapid. But here's your take home message. Um, then it gets to zero. Um, if we had a wider screen, and if there was someone in this audience who was 110 years old, um, who learned something that you didn't know before, and you went home, and, you, and tomorrow you remembered it, you have to remember it tomorrow, <laughs> um, your brain made new connections, your brain made a new circuit. Okay? So it, it never loses that ability to do it but it's harder. And at the same time, biologically, the energy cost to the brain to kind of change and adapt in the face of new challenges goes up. It literally requires more oxygen and more glucose for the brain to kind of re, re -adapt, to adapt with its circuits than to just create them the first time. So this is the sobering message. The longer you wait, the harder it gets. Never impossible, but it gets harder. And it gets more expensive. It's biologically more expensive. I'll leave it to the policymakers here to tell me how financially more expensive it is, but that's, th there's just no two ways around that. Okay, so um, does science have anything more encouraging to tell us other than it's not impossible? Of course it does, okay? This is the developmental curve for um, the building of the circuitry for executive function self-regulation. This is in the prefrontal cortex part of the brain. It's the part of the brain it's most different from all other animals. It's the part of the brain that takes the longest to develop because it's the part of the brain that distinguishes us from any other animal species. It's what makes us human. So you can see, first off, that there is, um, this, this doesn't really plateau until about age 30. And unlike the plasticity curve, it doesn't drop off very much. It kind of hangs in there for a reasonable period of time. So these skills are skills that take a while to develop, but we keep them for a reasonable period of time. This ability to kind of you know, come up with plan B, to focus your attention, to figure things out. Um, but here are the two messages. One is, 
first of all, it starts in infancy. It starts with the ability to focus your attention. We have interesting data coming out now to tell us, show us. Children, we see differences by social class in the ability to focus your attention before six months of age. Children who grow, and it's also very, it makes sense, children who grow up in reasonably stable, predictable environments from infancy are better able to focus their attention than children who grow up in very unstable, chaotic, unpredictable circumstances. Makes good sense. It's been shown by science. But the biggest gain is between age three and five. There is this dramatic increase in executive function skills. I can give you all kinds of fancy data. It's also as your grandmother could have told you this, and any preschool teacher can tell you this. What's the difference between a three-year-old and a five-year-old? A five-year-old can pay attention longer, can sit still longer, <laughs> can follow directions, can play Simon Says and understand the rule change. The smartest three-year-old can't do that. Simon Says is a game people you know, right? have to. So this is a period of rapid development. And these skills don't come in on automatic pilot. They have to be modeled and scaffolded by adults who have these skills. Children will automatically crawl and walk and speak in, in all but the, you know, you don't need a lot of input for that. But you will not automatically grow up learning to focus your attention and figure things out just by basis of maturation. It comes from scaffolding from adults. But here's the, here's the little window of optimism. Science is also telling us there's another period of accelerated development before you hit the adult plateau. This is the late adolescent, early adult plasticity of the prefrontal cortex. Gets a lot of attention. Um, so this is the time, this is the time of highest plasticity. This is the time that these parts of the brain are most susceptible to environmental influence. And we know these skills at any age are built largely by coaching and practice. And we in many of our programs are giving people advice and information about child development. Particularly individuals who because of their own early childhood experiences did not develop strong executive function skills, didn't have that chance. But here's a window, coaching, practice. It's harder, harder than getting it right when you're three to five. But maybe sometimes when we're not making the gains we want, it's because we're not using the knowledge we have, we're giving people advice. You don't develop executive function self-regulation skills from advice about how important it is to focus your attention and be planful. You need help with that at every age. So. I'm going to stop here. This is our website. I'm, um, some of you may be familiar with it. We've got a lot of material explaining a lot of this stuff. Um, sophisticated, complex science for non-scientists without dumbing it down. If you don't know about the website, I invite you to go there because the videos are on there. You can actually watch the second video in its entirety if you'd like, and you can dumb, download and use it. But let me just kind of stop here and let's open it up to the panel. The take-home message here is that everything we know about development tells us that adult caregivers and their capabilities are important determinants of children's early development. And I would humbly suggest that with all of the gains we've made, and this is a field that can stand proud on what it's accomplished. We'll talk at the end of the morning about what an innovation agenda could look like. There's, a, there's no defensiveness about the field, but we all know, and, and you all know, and it's in your materials, is that we're not equally successful for everyone. And population disparities are not things we've eliminated yet. And the question is, should we just keep doing more and more of what we're doing, or should we be trying to be more creative? And science is telling us, start paying more attention to caregiver skills, not as a passive educational issue, but as an active skill building function. So that's kind of my message for the first session. So thank you.